Warm up your fall weekends every Friday this month at Fridays at the Fountain in Crystal City with delicious beer and wine offerings and live entertainment. You can get all the details at crystalcity.org. And we have to share our newest sponsor, DC Lottery. A luxury handbag? Sign me up. You could win up to $10,000 or a fabulous luxury handbag from DC Lottery. Just pick up one of their scratchers. Go to your local DC Lottery retailer. Ask for the scratcher that looks like a handbag. DC Lottery, where lots of people win. All right. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. What's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey, phrase. What's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey, phrase. What's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey, phrase. What's the phrase that you hear? Tune in, yeah, you gotta tune in. Sarah Frazier on the mic, and she about to begin. The co host with the most born one looking fleek. Take it from me, you should be listening. Live from the nation's hip hop culture at its best. No need to second guess. Separated from the rest, entertaining nonetheless. Many topics to address. And she's a rebel, who's the number one hostess. Oh, Paul Wharton. Hey. Hey, doll. <laughs> How are I ya? mean, don't we break it down don't in here when that song is on? Oh, no. We do. We do every time. And by the way, in that <laughs> song, you know, we ought to have them, because uh, Teddy Beats, actually, our friend who I love him. composed that. I love him. He reached out to me recently, and he's like, hey, you know, do you want to bring back, like, any of the old songs, and I can do some remixes with Paul? I was like, yeah, we got it, because people <laughs> love the uh, the intro music. I mean, I just came from the gym, but there is nothing like working it out mm. to that song. Duh. I love it. You guys, welcome to the Hey Frage podcast oh God, with Paul I'm so Wharton. The excited to be here. Fabulous Paul Wharton. Uh, we are too. We do a, a weekly pop culture podcast every week. We put it out on Wednesdays. We're obsessed with you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, if you love the show and you listen to podcasts, we are doing an ongoing survey. It's super quick. It's like six questions. So in the body of this description that you'll see on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to us, there's a link for Lipson.com. Copy mm-hmm. and paste that and then give us some feedback because we would love to hear from you. Oh, I love and I love to get emails. And we love getting emails. There's mm-hmm. so many. We always, you can always email us. It's Paul Wharton style at yahoo.com and Sarah at heyfrage.com. So always you can email us. And of course, today, like every week, we have a smorgasbord <laughs> of topics to discuss. <laughs> smorgasbord. But, smorgasbord. but you were in New York last week. Oh my so God, I was. AJ the intern filled in for you. Uh, and the Sunday before that, we had your fabulous 40th birthday party. Many, many listeners have wished you happy 40th. They want to know how you're doing. So now, you know, post two weeks, are you feeling good? How's life? I just started to feel like myself this morning, to be honest Hmm. with you. Just this morning. Why? Because so much partying? Well, for one thing, yeah. For one thing, you know, I'm like, you know how you usually at 40, you've learned all your lessons and you're like, you know, I'm not going to do that. Well, I hadn't learned yet. So, I mean, I was still kind of hung over from that whole week. Oh my God. You were in your element though at your party. You were like loving. fun? Yes. You were having such a good time. You were on the microphone singing. You were getting all the women to do some sort of, I don't even know what it was. It was like a mix of. We were doing the butt. Ah, (laughs) sexy, sexy. Ah, ah. That was your first time doing the butt. (laughs) You're from DC. I know. It was my first time doing the butt. butt All night long. (laughs) But you were up there though. I loved it. We had such a great time. It was such a great great party. Yeah, shout out to uh, Tom at Hogo for my little tiki party. That was great. And Jim Beam for my tiki teenies. It was hysterical. And, you know, people that come to your party, the people watching alone is, like, the best part. Like, I loved your friend. I don't even know who he is, but he wears sunglasses inside the entire time. Darnell. Darnell. That's Darnell, Darnell Perkins. And the fabulous jacket. <laughs> Darnell Perkins went to the bar, and he was, like, the bartender was running around ragged, and Darnell yes. was like, are you going to get me a drink? Exactly. Are you getting me a drink? Oh, my God. I was like, um, sir, I think, you know, I, I, I know you're here, and you are fabulous. There's no <laughs> doubt. But there are five people ahead of you. And he was like, sir, sir, are you? looking at me. <laughs> it's like so I I died. Darnell was my oh favorite. Oh my god. Well the thing we about my party he's oh, a uh, character. He is amazing. He owned this place called Darnell's Lounge and it was on uh, 944 Florida Avenue. Such a great 
party thrower. This guy is just amazing. He's so damn funny. He's like my Karen, you know, like on Will and Grace. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Because yes. he like helps me do stuff, but he doesn't like really want to work. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? He's like too yeah, fabulous to yeah. work. Yeah, I could totally see that. And it was it was hysterical. So anyway, I don't know. But he was like so mad at that bartender. I think he went to like another bar downstairs or something. But I mean, it, but, and of course, you know, the party was loud. Yeah. So poor Darnell is like yelling at this guy <laughs> who's completely like high and such a hippie <laughs> and waiting on five other people. And the bartender did not give a shit. And Darnell was like, <laughs> Lucy, he's like, sir, <laughs> sir, I'm telling somebody about this. And the guy goes, I didn't know about any story. of this. Oh, it was All like my I favorite know moment. is I'm the only person that <laughs> I know that has a party at a dive bar, but everybody drinks like Cristal and Dom Perignon. Like, I know. And that was the <laughs> other thing. I think like you had also a, a list up there or something. And I think it was like Viv Clouco or something you could buy for like $75. Dan was like, are we supposed to buy these bottles? Well, I was like, no, honey. I well, think, this is the thing. I like I bought all of these regular stuff for people, <laughs> but I have a lot of fancy friends. Mm -hmm. So what I did is, um, uh, the bar owner let me sell it at cost. At got cost. So, it, Chris got it, got it, got so it. those were actually really great prices. 150 bucks for a crystal. That's really good. <laughs> that is really good, actually. Fantastic. We didn't buy it, though. But anyway. <laughs> anyway, well, it's good to have you back on the podcast. Oh, Everyone wish you a happy 40th. So we always like to start the show with a little bit of like a personal story or mm -hmm. something going on in our mm -hmm. lives. And then, of course, we got to get to all the biggest news and pop culture of the okay. week. So I'm dying because you and I were always de yeah. already debating this okay. off uh, before we started. Over the weekend, I went and had lunch with a very good friend of mine. She's uh, We worked in radio together. She's a few years older, and she has a daughter that's 15. Okay. And so she had this situation. Her daughter is in high school, like freshman in high school. And so she hangs out with 10 girls. And there's one girl who's the ringleader. Too who, big. That's a lot of girls. Too many girls. That's a lot. Well, she hangs out with one girl. Well, these ten, gr this group of ten girls. One mm -hmm. of them is the ringleader and is absolutely clearly a bully. Like just this, you know, awful. Is she pretty? <sighs> well, my friend's daughter is, but I don't know about the ringleader. Okay. So, but you know, they're I'm just, just wondering like what's cute. making her so mean, but okay, I'll get to that. Oh, I think it's the parents, but anyway, All I don't, right. I, but I don't even know them, but this mm -hmm. story just blew my mind. Cause I was like, Oh my God, what do you do? So anyhow, um, they they were having a little fall dance and this ringleader had told the 10 girls, none of us are going. So my friend's daughter comes home the night of the dance and she goes, no, none of us are going, you know, so-and-so told us that we don't, you know, we don't have to go. And so, um, that's a problem. I know. So my friend was like, okay, fine. The next day, my friend's daughter, 15, wakes up, and all over social media, all the girls had gone to the dance, and nobody had told her. Mm, I saw that one coming. You did? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. So my friend's daughter is heartbroken, Damn. and here's the dilemma. And I'm dying to know your advice because I was like, oh, my God, what do you do? So my friend said that a lot of other parents were like, you need to call the bully's mom and you need to have a discussion with her parents. Like, that is not acceptable. That girl has treated your daughter and other kids like shit for a long time. And you need to say something. But then my friend is like, well, my daughter's 15 and I want her to learn to be assertive. So I want her to talk to the girl herself. So are these parents of some of the other girls that went saying No, this? no. I think it's like just like other friends in the neighborhood. All their asses need to be put on blast. Really? Listen, because the other girls kept it from her daughter yeah. as well. So they were all in on it. Yeah. I just think it's horrible. Now, you telling the story, you know, it's bringing up, I always have a story. Well, I know. I want to hear this. And it actually reminded me of a situation, too. So I want to hear like it. Well, I did, but mine was like way different. So mine was. <laughs> I was really stupid, actually. But um, when I was in high school, I played basketball. Yeah. So for a long time, I dated the basketball coach's son. And then I dumped the basketball coach's son. And all of a sudden, I got no playtime. I was benched. So I went through the entire season living on the bench, right? And so at the end of the season, I was like, this is it. I am done with basketball. Like, clearly, he's, he's you know, this dad is holding a grudge mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so my mom ended up going to him and telling him that why we weren't going to play, why I wasn't going to play. And I don't know. I always felt like I probably should have just said it myself. But mm -hmm. I was probably the same age, like 15. Well, I think that this, I mean, just to answer your question about what this woman should do. But I, yeah, what do you think? I didn't even have advice because I'm like, shit, I feel like, yeah, the mom should call. But then I'm like, you know what? This is a good lesson for the daughter because these kids are, these girls are not her friends. They're not going to be your friends in six years. Yeah, but when you're in high school, that's all, all you think about mm. is this is what's happening now. This is my entire life. These people mean, you know, what they think about me is means so much to me you know the one thing that got me through high school is always knowing 
see, I had the exact opposite kind of thought. I felt like this is so temporary. If I can just get out of here, mm-hmm. I'm going to carry my ass to New York City. I'm going to make something. And these losers that called, you know, that bullied me. No, you know. Yeah. They were mean. Exactly. They were mean kids. But I um, believe that the woman should actually say something to the parents. But you would call all the parents. I would call Uri (laughs) Bai. Because I'm like, you you know, I, I really would. Because I would say, you know, listen, my daughter is a friend of your daughter's. I don't know if you know this, but they all iced her out of this dance and they all kept a secret and and they all lied to her and said that they weren't going to go and then they all went. And I just think it's mean-spirited. And if I was a parent, I would want to know that my kid did that and I would wear his little ass out. (laughs) I would wear him out. No, really. (laughs) I don't think you'll ever raise a kid that's like a bully, though. Oh, hell no. I mean, you know what I'm saying? That's why I think this girl that's a ringleader, I'm sure her parents are assholes. Like, I don't think you raise a kid I don't know I mean then I do have friends that have kids that kind of know that the kids are already like Mm -hmm. aggressive or Mm -hmm. kind of bullies and they're very aware of it so they're always you know on that kid's behavior so I think you're right I think you're right I think if I were the parent I would call because I think it's hard when you're 15 to go and stand up for, I think when you're 17 yeah. or 18, sure, yeah, sure. You, you should have your sea legs. Now, but. like what Hillary Clinton said, it does take a village. And I think a lot of people really believe in that because we all just want our kids to be nice people. We want them to go off and, you know, have a wonderful life. And there's no way that at 15 they can make all the right decisions. So it's up to us as parents but to you, get involved. You were saying when we were before we started the show that you thought, well, the mom going and calling could cause more issues for the daughter it could but after weighing the options i feel like the mom should say something okay so let me share my story yeah what so you i was about 13 or 14 years old and there was a big oh actually how old are you in the eighth grade you're like 14 15 so like there's i think it well this with my school um I think you're like 13 14 yeah 13 yeah. 14 and then i think when you go to freshman high school you become 15. right 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 so anyway so there was a big dance okay so there was a, the awkward years for me <laughs> or maybe i was fine and everybody else was awkward i don't know <laughs> i thought you we have got to post pictures from eighth grade oh i thought i was pretty fabulous I but mean, anyway <laughs> you know you were, I, I don't know you. i was in my head i was which is what got me through but i was so excited to be invited to this big party that this woman, um, this girl, Wendy, whatever her last name, Wendy and Margie, they were like the two cool girls. Oh my God, Wendy and Margie. One was blonde when Wendy was blonde and the other was brunette. So anyway, they were having this big party and everybody cool was going. Okay. Love it. And they were like total list Nazis. But I was invited to this party. Oh my God. It took me like two weeks to pick my outfit. <laughs> I mean, I had laid it all out every day. I would check on it when I came home from school. My outfit's still there. I would add little accessories and pieces to it. <laughs> I had like laid out a new hairbrush. You know, I bought some fresh hair gel. <laughs> well, like, no, no, no. It was like it's my so big coming out party. Oh like, my God. I'm invited to the big eighth grade party. This is it. I made it. The, oh, all this struggle and all this shit in the past I'm going to the big party no really I was ready for it so that Friday night this guy Rodney Puncelon I will never forget my sister dated his cousin Will John Puncelon (laughs) <laughs> I know, right? I love the name. Isn't that something? Yes. So um, Rodney was going to come pick me up with his, you know, his mom was going to drive. They were going to come pick me up. So um, I was starting to get ready for the party. I'd come home from school and I was starting to get ready for the party. And the phone rang. And I answered the phone and I just heard like a lot of <sighs> giggling. And <laughs> is this Paul? And I said, yeah. And then they were like, <sighs> Um, there was a mistake. Um, you're really not invited to the party. (gasps) And I'm like, what? And then, and then these were girls. And then a guy got on the phone and he says, yo, dude, you know, you can't come to the party. Yo, no, no, no. There's no way. No, you can't come. No. And then just kind of like laughed and hung up the phone. So I was devastated. I was freaking devastated. And I just remember, like, going down from my room all the way down to the basement and um, well, not all the way down, like, a couple floors down to the, like, laundry room. <laughs> and I sat next to the dryer. I remember the dryer was hot. And I, like, <laughs> I leaned down and I sat next to the dryer. Anyway, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't Aww. equipped for this. So the doorbell rang. It was Rodney. And I heard my mom. My mom went to the door. 
Okay. And she says, oh, hi, Rodney. Let me go get him. I, I don't know what he's doing. And she came down to the laundry room and she opened the door and I was just in a ball, you know, but I was, I wouldn't tell her what was wrong. And I right. said, I'm not going, you know, and she's <sighs> like, what? Well, Rodney's here. What do you, what? I said, I'm not going. I'm not going. Tell him I'm not going. So she went back upstairs and then she says, oh, Rodney, I don't know what to tell you, but I, he's not going. And he's like, he's not. And I just remember we lived on a big hill and I looked out the front window and I watched Rodney like run down to his car and get in his car. And as he drove away, I don't remember ever crying that hard oh as a kid. Oh my God. It ever, is ever, such ever. a big deal. Yeah, yeah. It's but I'm terrible. going to say something. I don't remember my mom really trying to get to the bottom of what was going on because I think that my mom love loves me and loved me so much that for me to almost tell her was too much for her to take. Oh. Right. She like just she'd wanted be it so to calm down. Like she, she made me a nice meal. You know what I mean? Right. She would just like to like kind of move past things like that. Right. Do Instead you know? of yeah. Now yeah. the difference of me being a parent now, having been through that, is no, no, no. I'm getting to the bottom of all this shit. In <laughs> fact, I'm going to the party. Oh, you going to the party? We going to the party? <laughs> you know what I mean? Put your shit on. Slick down your hair. Get in the Cadillac. We rolling. <laughs> Tell me where Wendy lives. Do you know what I mean? That's the kind of father I would be. They definitely don't want to see me. Okay? It would be a good thing you don't have a kid. Oh, we rolling. No, oh, we going to the party. We going. Okay? By hook or by crook, we showing up at the party. So, I love that, Paul. So I feel, I feel that although it was painful... I, I don't like to live in the past, and I don't live in the past. Right, but, but that was a big moment. I would moment. have liked to have been able to... For my mom to have pulled that out of me. Right. So I could have told her, you know, how hurtful that was and exactly what happened. So I just buried it. Oh, that's so heartbreaking. Yeah. And that does stay with you. That, that stays with you. Yeah. So absolutely. no, this mother should get to the bottom of it. See what's going on. I love and that. And see which of those other parents are a part of the problem and who wants to be a part of the solution. A hook or by crook. By hook done. or by crook, we rolling. <laughs> To the motherfucking party, okay? Oh, my God. You guys, I think we'll hear a lot from you about this. So you can always email us, Sarah at HeyFrage.com and Paul Wharton Style uh, at Yahoo.com. But that story blew me away. I was like, oh, my God, what do you do? And, and then I think, oh, my God, if I ever have a kid, what the? F- how do you do these situations? They're crazy. But I like that. Just get yeah. in the Cadillac. We're going. Just get in the Cadillac. We're rolling. My mama had a Fleetwood Brome. It was a diesel, honey. We heard it coming all the way down the street. Have you ever seen the Medea movie? No, I need to see. I haven't seen one. Isn't that not how you know I'm white? I have not seen You've one. You've not seen Medea roll up in that Cadillac no. once. I gotta go watch all the Medea films. My now. mother in 1981, she got a brand new Fleetwood Brougham. I was four years old, and my dad came rolling up, and I knew every car's name. I was like, "Mama, it's a Cadillac." No, we would roll up to the party. They would hear that diesel engine. Uh uh-uh. uh, it would be over. For everybody, better run. <laughs> Oh, my God. I die. You crack me (laughs) up. Um, All right. Some stories we want to talk about. So uh, when you fly, Paul, and we all know, I mean, I don't even know if this actually applies to you because you usually fly private. uh, No, don't. (laughs) (laughs) All right. When you used to fly uh, commercial. Uh, No, I fly commercial now. Oh, you do? Oh, oh, that's great. Okay, great. You're back from the uh, jet set. Well, I I mix it up, but I don't want to estrange anybody. (laughs) No, no, no. You have to be yourself. Uh, What do you usually take? Do you take the aisle seat or do you take the window seat? Okay, well. Because the psychologist says that this says a lot about you. Okay, let's see. Uh, When I use. No, I'm just kidding. No, when I fly to Cleveland, you know, I do those express jets. So everybody's in one class. So, you know, you just. Oh. But and then are there, wait, is there like a seat on each side? Well, there's like a, a row with one seat, and then on the other side, there's two seats on the other side. So I mean, I prefer the window always. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I always sit in the window too, which yeah. basically means that we're selfish assholes. <laughs> so of course, of course, you and I both like the window. We want the armrest and the window. Okay. <laughs> oh my yeah. god, a psychologist basically says that people who sit in the aisle are friendlier. They're social. They might be more nervous about flying, and they don't want to bother anyone by saying, "Hey, would you mind? I have to go to the bathroom." Yeah. Mm-hmm. People who sit next to the window have no problem asking people, hey, uh, do you mind moving? I need to go to the restroom. They're also usually more selfish. They're less anxious. They enjoy flying. And they're more confident in disturbing others. Mm, I don't know about all that. You don't? But I really do legitimately. Really? Like, that's us to a T. Do you think so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't like to tell people to move, you know, to get out of my way because I have to go pee. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't? Oh, I don't no. mind that at all. No, no. I'm I like, don't. please, you're on a, I mean, you know where you're sitting. I don't mind at all. I mean, come on. Now, how far will you go? Like, I'll wake people up. <laughs> I don't give a damn. I mean, all I try to do is, is, is uh, of courtesy is yeah. like when I get on the flight, I try to go to the bathroom before sure. Me too. we take off. Mm-hmm. And then people like, you know, I'm sitting in there or whatever, and I usually try to go when they're doing drink service, so people kind of hear the drink service or they're being interrupted. And then after drink service, I, I usually just try to hold it until landing, okay. unless I really have to go. Well, I got to tell you, I was flying from L.A., and this guy next to me was like, oh, fuck passing gas the whole time oh it was the oh worst God. experience i've ever had i could not and he told me his name was jim like in the beginning of the flight because we were nice to the beginning you know and i was like hi i'm paul you know he's you're like, my hey. neighbor and he's like hey i'm jim you know we talked a little bit and then like you know about mid i was taking a nap and i'm like what is this rumbling i feel i felt some rumbling and not just the smell was horrible finally i just said jim I'm gonna need you to pull your situation together. And he was like, "Sorry, man, I don't know what I don't know what I ate. Oh. Like, I just can't quite get it together." He could not <laughs> hold in those parts. It was horrible. Oh my god! That no, is, it was. I was devastated. That is disgusting. <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah. Oh my god! I can't even believe you said something. I give you a ton of credit for that. I was pissed off because, for some reason, I can never when you know I make my my reservation at the last minute. So oh, this sure, flight yeah, yeah. had no, um, you know, and the reason why I upgrade and stuff because I have a lot of miles. Okay, so let's just put it there. Right. So you always get a good upgrade. You get I usually yeah, upgrade. You to see where you but want. there was no upgrade situation. Like first class was completely sold out because everybody in LA is special and whatever, you know. Right. So um, I was sitting with Jim. He was farting. I mean, it was horrible. <laughs> I just, I just, I, it was just awful. It was <laughs> awful. And I always. Keep Keep an emergency Xanax just in case, like, the plane goes down. <laughs> oh, so you just pop that I right just before. pop that, and I'm oh. like, ah, I had a good life. Okay, well. <laughs> I mean, I almost popped my emergency Xanax because of Jim's farts. I mean, it was horrible. Oh, God, that sounds disgusting. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, it's just such a small, close quarters. Um, all we've been talking about, you know, of course, is Me Too. People have been very brave and sharing their stories. Now did you hear the AMC actress who claims that former President George H.W. Bush groped her from his wheelchair during a screening this week? Heather mm. Lind, who starred in uh, Washington Spies, detailed her accusations in a lengthy and since deleted Instagram post on Tuesday when she said she was disturbed after seeing a photo of President Obama with a fir- 41st president. Quote, I found it disturbing because I recognize the respect each presidents are given uh, for having served. And I feel pride and reverence toward many of the men in the photo. But when I got the chance to meet George H.W. Bush four years ago to promote a historical television show I was working on, he sexually assaulted me while I was posing for a similar photo, Lynn, 34, right? Wrote, he didn't shake my hand. He touched me from behind from his wheelchair with his wife, Barbara Bush, by his side. He told me a dirty joke. And then all of the while being photographed, touched me again. Barbara Mm. rolled her eyes as if to say, not again. Mm. His security guard told me I shouldn't have stood next to him for the photo. He's come out and apologized, by the way. Were you shocked to hear that? I was like, this old dude from his wheelchair? Mm. I guess once a pervert, always a pervert. I mean, you know, I guess you start talking about the privilege. Is it presidential privilege? Because I think she went on to say that, you know, they told her to call him Mr. President. Yeah, yeah, the, she, sec- she does, yeah. His security, his Secret Service guy said you shouldn't have, you know, stood right next to him. So, I mean, maybe he's got a little reputation. I, I know. Can you believe? I just have been so blown away. Like, all these men, uh, you know, th- that people have come out. And Corey Feldman came out again today. He says that he's going to get ready at some point once he gets all his legal ducks in order to name the men that have essentially kept a pedophile ring going oh, in God. L.A. Isn't it shocking? It's like, what the fuck? Aren't there enough uh, consensual adults who want to mm. have sex with you? You think it just becomes all about power? Like, it's just like you want to, once you become rich, powerful, what you want to just see how far you can push it or you think these people are just sexual deviants i don't know mm, i think a little mix of both but let me tell you about his old his old ass i would have popped that shit out of his hand they would have heard his knuckle crack a mile away no really no if he just put his old arthritis ridden hand up my skirt i know i would have crunched it no really Come on. I don't believe you. And he isn't denying it. President Bush would never, under any circumstances, intentionally cause any distress. And he most sincerely apologizes if his attempt at humor offended Miss Lynn. That was from a Well, he wasn't acknowledging the touch. He was acknowledging the joke. The joke, right. The joke. Yeah, so, you know, But I doesn't don't know. deny it. Isn't, isn't sure. basically saying that that part wasn't true. 
And when do you give people a pass? How old do they have to be to give them a pass, or do you never? Do you oh know, like, something like that, like, um... I don't know. Well, I think the wheelchair part kind of makes me go, well... But I don't know. I mean, people can be mad. I'm joking about that. I don't know. I mean, like I said, I... Here we go. I told yeah, you... Yeah, you know, people getting mad at us lately about speaking our opinion? Now, wait a minute now. Because we can't be... Look... We have a job, people, outside of this, where we have to, like, toe the line. Don't make us toe the line on here. We are not towing our I want to be here. really honest with people. I want to have fun. And some things I'm joking about and some things I get serious about and talk, tell all my business. But I want to be able to do that without people. I mean, certainly share your opinion. But we've been getting these emails of people saying, you know, I don't think you're being sensitive about sexual harassment. I don't think you're being sensitive about, the, you know, racial issues. I don't think you're being sensitive. And we're just like, wait, wait, stop. <laughs> That is not why we're doing a fucking podcast. We're doing a podcast so I can say a fucking podcast. I know. I agree with you. I, people are going to be offended. I, you know, I try to respond to as many emails as I can that we get. And, uh, and, and even when you and I had our blow up and people were like, mm-hmm. oh, Paul's right. You're wrong or whatever. Well, that was, you know, <laughs> oh, you liked the that people feedback. were, because I mean, you only got out of the hundreds and hundreds of emails we got, there's only one person that agreed yeah, with and you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the one email. I appreciate it. I hung on to that one. I started to feel bad for you myself. <laughs> Thanks. Where was your email? I was going to write you one myself and say, well, you're not so bad. (laughs) I just feel like people are going to, I don't know when we got so sensitive, but it's like a super sensitive. And I don't, and I understand, like, look, we've talked about this. I don't feel like I've ever really been sexually assaulted. Thank God. And I never suffered sexual um, trauma as a child. I was never sexually abused. I was never abused. So I don't know what that's like. And it's clear that it's an epidemic. So many kids go through that and I don't know what the hell is wrong with people, why they're wired to like be attracted to kids or, um, or, you know, these women that say that these men, I mean, my God, yeah. this other woman came out this week and says that Harvey Weinstein ripped out her tampon and then oh, raped Jesus. her. Yeah. It's like That's crazy. And how he's not in jail. I don't know how the hell he's not in jail. Well, I got sexually harassed by a taxi driver. (laughs) Let me tell you about these taxis. Do you even know anymore? I don't know. And and that's the thing is I want to be inappropriate on this podcast, too, because we talk about sex. And, you know, I mean, who doesn't want to, you know, dildo in here or whatever. I I don't well, this is kind of a, an issue that that runs pretty rampant in the taxi community, and I very rarely take taxis because you know we're all like taking Lyft, Lyft or Uber, and Uber or yeah. So when I get in this taxi the other day, this happens all the. It's like they read out of a manual. Okay, so I get in the taxi. First of all, he has to um, use a piece of rope to tie the trunk down. First issue. Okay, <laughs> I'm like, who has been on the inside of this trunk trying to okay. kick it open? All right, okay. so I was a little suspect. But you know, we're just going over from like 16th Street to 7th Street. We get to ride. Oh, so um, um, where are you going? Are you going on a date? No, I'm not going on a date. Oh, do you, you got girlfriend? No, I don't have girl. Oh, oh, you have wife? <laughs> sir, <laughs> sir, look, I, I've been down this road. I already know what you're gonna say. Now, I don't have wife. I don't have girlfriend. I don't date women at the moment. You know, yeah. at least not that I come out about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I ever tell you, you know, oh, you got boyfriend? No, I don't have a boyfriend. You like boy? Yes, I like boy. Oh, I know another boy that like boy. He like me. You like me? No, sir, I don't like you. Turn left on 7th Street and <laughs> drop me the fuck off. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> well, that was like... Do you call that harassment? But I'm not calling the the, the uh, taxi commission. I mean, I, and I'm not minimizing anybody else's thing because... I know. It's the thing. I I'm don't know what to say anymore. And I'm kind of a hardcore kind of guy. Like, I mean, I can... Mm-hmm navigate this world yeah I'm i feel a man the same too, way i feel the same way do you know what i mean yes it's just like little things like that and the guy i mean and he was a little bit more than what i'm sharing like he was you know like oh i like to fuck and all that shit you know what i mean but i'm like oh god <laughs> see but my problem is when people do that to me yeah. then i start messing with them back yeah you know what i mean and it's just terrible like mm-hmm. oh you like to fuck i like to fuck too <laughs> and i fuck hard <laughs> Oh my God! You want to see my dick, and then like then, 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 then they usually drop me off. <laughs> so ah, I, say, ah. <laughs> I know that's the reaction I get. It's what I oh always do. Like God. when when guys 
guys like on the radio or whatever would send yeah. me dicks, I'd be like, what a gorgeous <laughs> cock. You want mine? And then they never responded back. I was like, oh, well. So you give as well as you get. See, that's the thing. Right. I always mess with people, but I understand right. that not everybody is like, finds it funny. Sure. You know? And again, I've never been in a position where I truly thought, oh my God, I'm about to get raped. I'm about to get, I've never been, I, I one time put myself in a really bad situation drinking and thankfully the guy was really respectful, but that was like the only time and I was more like, why would you do that? Wow. You know, I mean, and he was very good, but I'm like, oh my God. Anyway. There's enough people out there that want it. Um, you know, and it's consensual yes. where you really don't have to. And it, I'm taking. I, I look, agree. I, I'm sharing this from personal experience. <laughs> you really don't have to. So if you're out there harassing people, stop it. Mm-hmm. Stop it right now because you don't have to. Because there's enough people. You know, you make enough rounds around this town, you're going to find somebody that wants to go back to the house. With Hop you. on Craigslist casual encounters. There's so many people looking. Jesus, <laughs> y'all still doing that, huh? See, the gay guys have oh. grinder. Oh, right, or grinder, sorry. Yeah. Um, so how do you feel about this? A woman says she spent $55,000 to look like a Bratz doll. Oh, if you Jesus. were going to spend money on plastic surgery to look like somebody else, is there anyone that you, Ugh. you know, we've got the human Ken doll, um, and now she wants to be known as the human Bratz <sighs> doll. You think she looks like one of those Bratz oh, dolls? God. She just looks. These Bratz dolls, you know, I don't have kids, so you like, I don't, I don't. Uh, no, 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 no. That no. idea? No, lady, no, lady, no. Here are the Bratz dolls. You know, these dolls, I don't know. These mm. things look so like mini hookers. So big lips and, and little nose. I mean, <laughs> yes. so, yeah, they look like pretty much everybody else that has plastic surgery, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, she says $55,000 and she's not going to stop. She says that, um, you know, she really wanted uh, to look more like a Bratz doll. And she's also transgender, by the way. Oh, okay. Um, so she has bum plants, nose job, jaw slimming procedures, and a desperate quest to continue to look like a, a Bratz doll. Well, I think to each Lord. his or her own. I think people should be able to do what they want to do. The only thing that I know just from being in the beauty business yeah. is that you'll never really achieve that through plastic surgery, you know? I, yeah. I think people should do exactly what they want to do, but I think that there's a myth out there that you can pay a doctor to make you look like some like this thing that you want him, you know, you want to look like a Ken doll or a Barbie and you're going to look perfect and flawless. You're going to look like you've been all cut up, pumped up, oh. deflated, you know, and whatever else. I mean, it just it's just not that seamless and flawless. Jolene Dawson is her name. And yeah, she says she's not stopping until she achieves her ultimate beauty. Um, you know, we, we were just talking about like sexual assault and trauma. Um, scientists say they're getting close to erasing memories in snails that could eventually translate to humans. Um, a new study of snail neurons suggests that it's possible to wipe out specific memories. And scientists think that a drug could be developed to do the same for humans in the future. If you had had any sort of something traumatic that was very painful and you had the option to take a pill or go in and be rewired, would you? Mm, I haven't had any of that happen yet in my life. Nothing Knock that on I wood. Nothing that oh. I couldn't handle. If I witnessed 9-11 and I was there, right. um, if I witnessed a horrible murder or something like that, then potentially, I mean, potentially, but there's nothing that has happened to me that hasn't made me stronger, you know, even if it was a terrible tragedy. I mean, that's what, that would be my question to scientists is like, okay, so we're getting ready to maybe like, okay, be able to, um, rewire somebody so they forget something tragic, tragic. You're in a terrible accident. Mm-hmm. You're in nine 11. Mm-hmm. You see all that, you know, you were there at Las Vegas or something mm-hmm. and you become absolutely like you paralyzed with fear, but does it right. Isn't that the adversity and those moments that make you realize what like life is all about? Sure. And you have either that moment of, okay, am I going to choose to be a good human in this world mm-hmm. or absolutely. am I going to let this take over? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you think is going to happen if we can really rewire people? Yeah. And I hate to equate everything to either the Golden Girls or the Kardashians, but um, <laughs> in keeping with my tradition, <laughs> but, on the latest episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Let's go with what we no, know. But actually, you know, Kim Kardashian talks about the Paris robbery and how as traumatic as that was, it made her a better person. It made her a person that wants to spend more time with her kids, more valuable time with her kids. It made her a person that doesn't value the diamonds and the this and the that as much as she did before. She, in right. a sense, she said it kind of snapped her back into reality and what 
is really important in life. So, you know, you may think that, oh, I want to forget that, but it actually, for a lot of people, those really rough times, um, you know, <clears throat> help you help well, make them scientists and researchers also say that they want to use it less to get rid of your memory, but more to stop triggers. So it could be used in like, okay, say you were robbed or say like you were mugged near a mailbox. So they want to rewire your brain. So every time you see a mailbox, you just don't automatically think of that mugging. Mm-hmm. Like, do you think it would be good? I don't know. I feel like once you start no, messing I with this stuff, start losing other stuff too, it's like, where am I? Yes, I you think. Know, it's, I mean, I think you would lose some other things too that you might want to remember. I think it's really you scary. Know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you never watched the documentary on Netflix, Making a Murderer, did you? I did. I didn't get. Yeah, I did, you I did. did? Actually. I watched the first season. Oh, yeah. awesome. Okay, so so you know Stephen Avery and um, his nephew Brendan Dassey still remain in jail for the okay. uh, alleged. Well, so I saw convicted. season one. Oh, okay. Have, you haven't seen season no, the I second didn't one. see season two. Okay, well, Stephen Avery's attorneys came out this week um, and say that they have new evidence that is going to prove that Stephen Avery and Brandon Dassey had nothing to do with the actual murders. They go on uh, into detail. They say new evidence allegedly connects Hallbach's ex-boyfriend, Ryan Hillegas, with the crime scene. Hillegas was in possession of her day planner from which he tore a page, giving to a friend of Hallbach's, who in turn handed it over to police on November 3rd. Uh, Dennis Coakley claims she spoke to Hallbach on the phone around 11.35 a.m. on October 31st, the day she died. Hallbach was driving an R, a RAV4 vehicle at the time and made notes in her day planner. The attorney says this evidence with the day planner was in the vehicle when Hallbach was killed and the fact that it ended up in Hillegas's possession would have linked him to the crime scene. Mm. They also go on to say that new forensic testing of a bullet fragment found in Avery's garage, which is alleged to have had entered and exited Hallbach's skull, contained, quote, no particles consistent with Bone, meaning that that had, was not the bullet fired. So anyway, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Those two remain in jail, and I don't know. That story is unreal. But Sarah, you host a Mansion Murder podcast. Yes, I'm so working on that true crime. Yes. Aren't you able to drive the narrative, though? Can't you make the story? I mean, I'm not saying this is what Thanks you do. Thanks a lot. No, no <laughs> Great. but I mean. That's for, what people are saying online. Okay, no, but for a documentary film or series like this, for a docuseries like Making a Murder. Yep, yep. Um, can't the producers drive the narrative and make you believe whatever you want to believe? Like, See, uh, I don't know. I guess you could. But I don't think these people are doing that. I don't think the two women that are doing Making the Murderer are doing that. And we're certainly not. I think what people don't realize is that like, and I'm sure the Making the Murderer women had to do this too. Everything that we publish, everything that I've published through this Mansion Murder podcast has to go through legal. Mm -hmm. And these attorneys are very, very thorough. They're doing their job. They're playing devil's advocate. So lots of times, like in the Mansion Murder one, for example, there's other stuff I know. Mm -hmm. There's other stuff that is, would look favorable or not favorable to both sides. But I have to be able to prove that. And I have to have people and sources that are going to say, you know, yes or no to it. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, I think, and we ran into this with mansion murder, you have the Manitowoc County um, Police Department who probably did make major fuck-ups. They don't want to work with the Netflix or the producers. So therefore, silence ends up making you look guilty. And I think lots of times in these cases, and we're dealing with that now in the mansion murder ones, if people aren't willing to come forward and go, look, even even to say on record, I can't talk to you, but mm-hmm. more could come out, or we are exploring these things, then you shut down immediate rumors. But these police departments and attorneys and everything go, nope, nope, we're not going to say anything. And then it just makes it look like... Okay, because I remember when I watched season one of Making of a Murderer. Is it yes, Making of making, a Murderer? Um, making a Murderer. Making a Murderer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I watched season one, everybody was like, oh my God, this is horrible. They need to get out of jail. And then I saw season, I didn't watch season two, but I, I started to hear people's kind of perspective change a little bit. Yeah, well, now, well, I think, I mean, season two did make it seem like, boy, it's <clears> awfully <throat> coincidental that Stephen Avery didn't do this. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, you're like, damn, did this dude really like... I mean, he gets out of jail, right, by like a miracle, and then he really commits another murder? Mm. Well, he didn't commit the first murder. He was he was innocent of that. I don't know. I mean, I think, because the theory was in the second episode, or the second season of Making a Murderer, is that 
um, Stephen Avery's relatives did have something to do with it, okay. which it seems like that makes more sense. Mm-hmm. But of course, you're going to look at Stephen Avery. Mm. I don't know. It's kind of a fascinating. Uh, Look, we work with some great sponsors, and Mervis has an awesome event coming up. We work with Mervis Diamonds. We're going to be hosting another event with them uh, coming up in December. But before that, they're doing a really good event. Yeah, they're doing a holiday preview event. So, you know, this is the gift to give something glamorous. It's happening November 11th and 12th at two of their stores, actually at the Rockville store um, on Rockville Pike and at their Tyson's Virginia store on Mervis Way. You can check them out at MervisDiamond.com or on one of our blogs, Paul Wharton Style or Hey Phrase. That'd be a fun time. What you going to get me? Perfect. Oh, I'm going to get you a bracelet, I think. No, you... (laughs) You know what? I think we should do a... Uh, you need a gonna... necklace. Oh, yeah. I feel I like you were trying on... That, that's beautiful. It's nice, right? Where's that from? This is is that from, like Cartier? This is from Saxe, Fifth Avenue. I oh, don't my God. Know that's what gorgeous. The line is, but yeah. That's adorable. I know. A Rolex for Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I say something to yeah, these people yeah. that have been listening to me talk about these, you know, long distance relationships that I've had? Yes. So I'll tell you. Okay. So the guy um, from Don't Brussels my, and Rome, you guys, she's scratching her tip is like, like crazy. I know. I know. Is what that is like a sign on? or something oh, weird? God. I don't know. I, I know. Not. Sorry. Well, I'm just going to feel have... my nipple. Why is that my one nipple itching really like a lot? I don't know, but it, is it okay? I think it is. Okay. Anyhow, <laughs> so my birthday. Okay, so has anybody ever been dating someone, or have you been dating someone? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's see what um, Dan did. Okay. Where it, your birthday is coming, and you don't want to be disappointed by what they give you or what they don't give you, so you just warn them a lot. Okay, yeah. So this person I'm seeing who lives in Brussels and Rome, you know, I wanted to make sure, okay, do you have all my addresses? You know, I have an office. I have a house. I'm, I don't know. You know, I sent you all my addresses, <laughs> you know? And he's like, okay. He's like, why does he keep sending me all these different addresses? Well, just you can send it to any one of these addresses yeah. and I can get it. Um, and then um, I kept saying, my birthday's in a week. Uh, he said, I know your birthday's in a week, but it's not today. And I'd say, my birthday's in four days. I know your birthday's in four days, but it's not today. <laughs> so on my birthday, okay. I'm like calling my doorman. I'm calling the people at my office. Like, hey, look, is there? Just, there's going to be some flowers. <laughs> They're going to be big. <laughs> okay. Don't let the delivery man come. Make sure you send them to my to my um, to my apartment. <gasps> Do you know? Because okay. I like I just knew something was coming somewhere. Okay. Do you know? At about 6 o'clock in the evening, which is 12 o'clock midnight his time, I call all my pe- doorman at the, my office, place. Office, I call everyone. office. Look, are you sure everybody's packing up? You know, I hear them pushing in their drawers and shit. Like, everybody's ready to go. Ain't nobody seen a flower the first, okay? <laughs> so, I send homeboy a message like, so let me just understand this exactly. Like, no flowers on my birthday. It was a big birthday. Yeah, big, you know, huge. No flowers. And he says, I didn't have your address. So then I go and screenshot the (gasps) two times I sent him the address. And then he says, you are right. Now, he had said on my actual birthday, he had sent me all these, oh, happy birthday and the little emojis and all that bullshit, you know, but no actual gift. So anyway, so I let a couple days pass and I didn't say anything. So then he reaches out like, oh, are we something wrong? And I said, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, my expectation is that on my birthday, and it was a really big birthday, you would send (laughs) flowers or something, you know, to me for my birthday. And he said, well, since my mom died in May, it was too painful for me to buy flowers since the funeral. What you going to say to somebody that says some shit like that? Oh, my God. That's like the worst thing. I feel like he's giving you the ultimate, I don't know. Now I'm feeling like this guy's full of shit. I mean, that's like... But he could have bought you a million other things. He could have sent you wine. He could have sent you champagne, something from Brussels. I don't know. Something European. He could European. have written me a check. He's fucking rich. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I'm just like, okay, no to the flowers, but shall I send my checking and routing? I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> What's it going to do? you know what I'm saying? Like so, you're really funny though because I learned this about you with your birthday party. Like mm-hmm. you do expect people in your life Absolutely. to give you something. But Absolutely. Do you feel like maybe you should just like you know in the, on your 41st birthday like give up those expectations? Like maybe you just shouldn't anticipate because I know there were moments in your past couple of birthday week or so, and it was a big one, mm-hmm. but that you were disappointed with how friends kind no, of reacted. No, I don't expect them to give me something like a gift. I expect them. 
to show me in some way through effort or some kind of way, come outside of themselves in their normal daily routine and show me how much this relationship means to them. Because I spend all year working on my relationships with my friends, make sure, making sure that I'm there for them when they're going through anything, showing up even when they're not going through something, I show up anyway, you know, right. just when I, and it's always in the nick of time. And sometimes that's me giving them gifts, but more than that, it's my time and my effort. Right. So that's what I expect. Not for people just to show, oh, happy birthday. You want a beer? No, I don't fucking drink beer. <laughs> Okay, no. <laughs> and you knew it was my birthday. <laughs> you know what so, I mean? But you had said, too, that you thought you were going to do some cleaning house of friends. Do you feel like, like, like what's, what's, where do you go yeah. with this guy who didn't acknowledge your birthday? I mean, he acknowledged it, but didn't give you a gift. Well, I mean, I'm a little icy at the moment. But do you think I, you should just, like, not have anything to do with him? Or do you no, think? No, I don't need to do that. And first of all, I think I told you this before. I stop telling people that I don't deal with anymore that I'm not dealing with them. I don't do that anymore. You just kind of let I it. used to say the only time I want to tell, like, if you and I were in having a moment, mm-hmm. and I said, you know what the fuck is your problem, Sarah? Let me tell you about you. I, the only reason I would do that is because I want you to fight for it. I want to work it out. If I get into that with you, other than that, if I'm done, you don't even know that I'm done. I'm just done. Hey, I haven't heard from Paul Wharton in a while. You heard from him? (laughs) You know, you might send me a text. I might say, "Hey, girl, how you doing?" Are you going to show up for the show? Are you like, what's going on? No, but you know, if if you want somebody to, if there's passion there, then you know, you'll you'll put all that stuff out there because you want somebody to fight for the relationship and, and keep moving. Now, this guy, I'm not necessarily done with him because I think he's a good guy and I do respect the fact that he was very close to his mother and I understand sure. that. But I do think that he could have done something else. If Flowers, you know, if that was a, a sensitive kind of area for him, he could have done something else. And I do have an expectation. And, but that's weird that you kind of told him and he still didn't send anything. Like, I mean, I can remember my old boyfriend, Ed, who was like older. And one time for my birthday, he tried to give me like framed baseball tickets. And I was like, <laughs> you almost oh. to, and I was like, um, was he, uh, to this a game isn't that, a gift that, was... that we went to. Like, okay. Yeah. Well, and it that's wasn't like thing. our first date. It was like just a random, maybe it was our first Yankees game or something. Well, I'm really like, clear what? with people that I'm, with men that I'm dating about what, what generosity means. Okay. So if you have to go, that's not being generous to me. Mm. Do you know? Like if you are buying something like a ticket to an event or um, a vacation and you go, <laughs> I don't really count that as you being generous right. because I'm a good time. Like, yes. You know what I'm saying? Like yes. I keep that party going. Like, I'm going to be a fun person to go on vacation with. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you're just paying for a good time. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let the emails roll. But that's the way I feel. Like, somebody that is being generous with someone that they care about is like, I'm giving you something that I have nothing to do with. Like, you go, you enjoy it. It's just for you. Oh, my God. You're hysterical. You have to let me know what people say. Okay. I mean, I, I feel like everyone listening wants your self-confidence of just like, no, you're going to buy this because I'm bringing you the good time. Right. I'm like, you know, <laughs> if you want to talk about a vacation that's, uh, you know, you being generous and you send me and like my friends on a plane and we go somewhere and we have fun. Now, if you got to go, it does not count toward you being generous. I, I will go with you. Right. But it's not going to count toward, the, oh, he's so generous. He took us on vacation. But he went. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm oh sorry. God, that's the way I've worked it out. Maybe that's why I'm still single. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to hear about it for sure. Uh, there's a couple more stories, too, we want to get to. But also we want to announce uh, we're very excited um, as this podcast grows yes. that we are working with DC Lottery. They're our newest partner. And they're also running a great handbag scratcher right now. So um, we're excited to have DC Lottery on. Ladies. As you know, a great outfit can totally define your look. And a beautiful designer handbag can take that outfit up a notch. So how would you like to win a luxury brand handbag to enhance your wardrobe? Well, play the new handbag scratcher from the D.C. Lottery. Not only can you win cash prizes of up to $10,000... But enter the second chance drawing and you have a chance to win one of seven luxury brand handbags or cash prizes to help you pick out your own new bag. Play the handbag scratcher today and you just might win that handbag you've had your eye on. 
Visit your local D.C. Lottery retailer and ask for the scratcher that looks like a handbag. Only from the D.C. Lottery, where lots of people win. Okay, so a couple other stories I wanted to ask you about. Um, Justin Timberlake had announced just a couple days ago that he is going to be the headline entertainer for Super Bowl, um, whatever it is, 52, 53, 50, whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, who cares? Um, so anyway, <laughs> my thing is, though, everybody is fired up. Will Janet Jackson, do you think he is going to have her on with him? If he's smart. How can he not, right? I feel like this is probably like not even a story worth talking about because she's definitely coming out, right? Don't you think there'd be huge backlash? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I remember after the big controversy, Nipplegate, I mm-hmm. believe it's referred to as. Um, after Nipplegate, Janet Jackson, who I've loved since I was 10 years old, used to play at the huge arenas. After Nipplegate, she was going on tour playing at like Constitution Hall. So for people that don't know in DC, like that's like a smaller venue. Yep. She was doing like these much smaller venues. She used to do these big arenas. Well, anyway, now with her current tour, she's back. She's doing these huge arenas. She's selling out most of them. And I just think she's super hot. So for a couple of reasons, for one thing, she's doing a great show right now, and she would be a great performer. Oh, my God. And for the other reason, because of everything that's happened in the NFL, I just think it is a time that would really be kind of a sign of unity, and that would be a full circle moment, I think, for everyone. I mean, I think she has to come out, especially in light of, like, the whole thing with Me Too. I mean, I can't remember, like, watching that act and then, like, the cameras and everything after. I mean, it was such kind of a violent act, too, of him, like, sort of ripping at her boob, you know, and then it exposes her nipple and whatever. I mean, you know, I know they both were involved in kind of choreographing that to some extent. But, I mean, she has, I think, taken a lot more of the brunt of that whole incident. And so to not have her on, I think, would be, I mean, I, I... said this the other day, but I don't buy albums, but I would never buy his again. But let me ask you something. Did they ever really say what happened? Did they own it? Did they say that they planned it? Did they say it was an accident? Well, they claimed it was an accident, but they had rehearsed together and they rehearsed this kind of like, um, I, I think her, okay, the way I understand it, I'm sure listeners probably know the story better. But I think, didn't she sort of have some sort of like kind of first layer of top or something? So he was going to like pull that off or whatever. But something was under there. Right. Right. And then the whole thing came off. Right. I think was how it went down. Okay. So I I don't think like either one of them, but I, you know, I don't know the whole story. Well, I'd love to see them together. I'd love to really just see her, but I mean, I like him too. They should definitely be there together. Oh my God. Amazing. Um, What do you think about this? You probably don't watch Jimmy Kimmel Live. Do you watch that show at all? At late night. Jimmy Kimmel, I love him. You do? Oh. I love him. Oh, my God. Me, too. I do. I yeah. think he's fabulous. He's getting a lot of heat, though. Have you ever watched his Halloween prank where Jimmy Kimmel encourages parents um, to tell their kids that, oh, their uh, Halloween candy is gone the day after Halloween, <laughs> and then they record it? <laughs> and you yeah, have seen I that? I think it's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they ate all of your Halloween candy, and there's no more left. Oh, my God. These kids. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh. Do you think it is? Because a child psychologist says it's awful. He needs to stop yeah. this. Do you think it's true? It's gone! I ate it all! <laughs> I ate all your Halloween candy. What? Oh. It's hilarious. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, Sarah, we're talking I about candy. candy. That's not like oh a big deal, You're you know? You're just joking. Uh, uh, no, okay. I ate it all. <laughs> oh, my God. The kid like this thing. Anyway, we can play these all day. So do you think it's psychologically damning? A, essentially, this week, a child therapist came out and wrote an op-ed, um, or wrote an article for the Washington Post, and says that Kimmel's Halloween prank is absolutely damaging to children, and that it actually creates in kids a lack of trust with their parents. You think that's true? No, I think it's getting kids ready for the bigger issues in life that are <laughs> that are just up the road. You know, like let's just start with candy and see how you take that. You 
know what I mean? <laughs> we're gonna move on to goldfish, and then and then you know uh, other stuff that happens in in kids' oh, lives. Oh, I don't know how I feel because it is really. I'm sorry. I, I actually do think those were cruel, and the kids had funny reactions. I feel like they don't pick reactions where the kids like lose it totally. <laughs> but the psychologist says that many kids will feel this particular prank is an emotional gut punch, a breach of their parents' love. When we consider that the sole aim of this betrayal seems to be the amusement of other people, in this case, millions of strangers watching on TV, we've got to question the value of the adults involved. Do you okay. think it's that deep? I don't, but I hear their point. Oh, man, that's a tough one for Jimmy Kimmel. Like, I, Would you keep doing that prank? Things like that make me happy I'm not a parent. <laughs> so many parent topics today I mean, we've had so many parent topics i didn't even want to do the one about you know should you punish your kids did you see that article about why you shouldn't punish your children if they lie to you like were you punished for lying when you were a kid yeah i one time i okay do you remember chrissy snow from Three's Company. No. Chrissy Snow, Suzanne Summers. Oh, yes. Okay, okay, got it. So she used to flip around in these, like, heels, like, that didn't have a strap on the back, like these little strapless mules, you know, whatever. So my mom had some beautiful, like, um, rhinestone heels, and they had a strap on the ankles. Well, I found myself downstairs in her closet. She had a big closet in the basement with a bunch of clothes and shoes. And I used to, you know, when nobody was looking, I'd flip around <laughs> for a couple minutes and then, you know, I'd put everything back. Um, well, this one particular day, I decided I was going to flip around in one of her many pairs of shoes, but they weren't quite like Chrissy Snow's. They had a strap on the back, so I took a pair of scissors and I cut the satin strap off the back of these heels. Ooh. I flipped around for literally 30 seconds and I put them back and okay. I threw the strap away. Got it. Little did I know, my mama was going to some inaugural, like, I don't remember what year it was, but those were the shoes she was going to wear with her dress. So when, when she went to pull out those shoes, all I heard was, oh! <laughs> she didn't, she was so mad, she didn't even come for me or my sister. She called my dad. My dad came home. <laughs> she called your dad. I love it. My dad came home. And he was like, all right, now which one of y'all did this? Because I'm about to wear your little asses out. And I looked at my sister, and she looked at me. My sister said, he did it. I said, she did it. <laughs> and he wore our asses out. And we would go in a circle. Well, which one? She, she was looking at me like, why are you doing this to me? And I'm oh like, you got to take one for the team. <laughs> I so what even happened? Know I was flipping around in the right. shoes. Right. What ended up? So what ended up happening? I lied. And, and, and did she get the? Did your sister take the fall for it? No, we both got our butts beat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well, this is uh, the psychology behind this is interesting too, and it basically says that if you punish your kids, you're actually encouraging them to lie and be even sneakier. And it essentially says that you need to talk to your kids about why telling the truth is important. You think hmm. that? I mean, I, I don't know I if that like, works. You don't think so? I, I kind of like this. They say model behavior. They say kids learn to lie from adults, even okay. little white lies, which mm -hmm. I think is probably true. And um, they say that... Uh, Where did that term come from? Little white lies. Lies that don't really mean much because they're told by white, white people. <laughs> so like a big black lie is like a big bad lie. <laughs> Probably. You know what? We need to Google that, too. We don't have any interns today, so we're actually, even though we have computers in front of us, we're completely <laughs> useless. We're like, hmm, where does that come from? Hmm, we need a what lot about of, that? We do need a lot of support, right? We, do, we need a ton. We're like, <laughs> um, anyway, I'll have to Google that. Um, they say model behavior. Um, sitting around every night at, dinner at the dinner table and playing a game where every person has to tell a truth from their day can be a good way to start praising your kids. Oh, that's nice. Uh, De-emphasize punishment and uh, emphasize more about about the moral aspect of it. They're unlikely to change behavior or develop the conduct you want. That does not mean ignoring, lying, or letting it go. Rather, use very mild pu punishment, um, lose loss of a privilege for a brief period of time. More severe, harsh, or enduring, pun enduring punishments like shouting or taking away things for a week are not more effective in actually changing the, the frequency of lying. I believe that's true. I, like, I, I had to kind of stop myself when I got older and realized, why am I lying? Mm, yeah. I basically just lie because I don't want to hurt people's feelings or I just don't want to tell them no from the start. Well, I feel like, because, you know, I think a few years back I tried to get to the root of that. I'm like, okay, now let me try to cut this lying thing completely out. Oh, right. What why, is yeah. the thing that makes me lie? And the thing that makes me lie, I feel, is people 
feeling like they can ask me things that they really shouldn't be asking me. Oh. You know, and instead of me saying, like what? well, now I say that's not your fucking business. <laughs> or why are you asking me that? I mean, even things like. Um, oh, like whatever it comes to like dating or finance. No, just or, anything. Okay. Anything that's not their business. Like even when I'm out, I don't like people asking me where I like. They say, where do you live? I, in D.C. Well, where? Oh. Uh, I, between Logan and um, DuPont Circle. Well, where? Motherfucker, like you know what I mean. Like the old me would probably say like a, a wrong street because I don't want to tell the person where I live. But sure. I would like, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying it's none of your business. <laughs> you know, so I would say, well, I live at uh, seventeen ten on um, Eighteenth Street. If you like to know, you know, like what's the point? So the new me says, well, I mean, that's all you get. Yeah. You know? So they say. um, uh, they may ask about, did you, whatever, relationships right. or one night stands or, you know, just that. listen, I don't know you that well. Right. So before you get me up in here lying, mm-hmm. I'm just going to tell you this. Mm-hmm. Back up. Yeah. And we're not there yet. God. Yeah. No, I get it. And, and then I'm, the I'm lying has gone that. down. Yeah, it does. You have to really unlearn lying. It's, yeah. it's funny. It's like almost you're, we're almost all programmed to do it. But I wonder if it's because you do get punished and, and then you yeah. become sneakier with the lie because you know there'll be it's consequences. It's self-preservation, I guess. It's kind of funny. Um, yeah. One last really quick story. Uh, I thought this was mind-blowing, but Wall Street Journal says that um, they have a career coach out with the signs that you're in trouble at work. <laughs> and the whole story that they did, I thought this was complicated is that a lot of people are blindsided when they're fired. They don't realize that they're going to be fired or demoted. Do you think that's true? I feel like any time mm. there was conflict at work, like 107.3, the last job we had, when we were all, they were like going to switch formats, we were all fired, and then we were offered some different jobs or whatever. But we knew it was coming. Like people, it was like so obvious. And people were talking about it in the office. But I think people are, especially in our business, I mean, everybody's paranoid. I mean, you always think something's coming. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, actually, I don't anymore. And now I'm like, I just feel like the industry is changing so much. Like, and now I feel like it's all about what we're doing. It's all Mm -hmm. independent. I mean, that's where it's at. Like, whatever. I could go on a whole tirade about that. I'm sure. I'm sure. So, but I don't think that people always know. I think, I mean, we talked to somebody yesterday. They don't, apparently. came to my office and she was telling us about, you know, how she lost her job and everything was going great. She just got back from a big convention where she was the headliner for the whole big, you know, network that she worked for. Yeah, she was completely blindsided. I was like, really? Yeah, they said, come to HR. And then that was just like that. Well, here are the signs. They say your boss stops dropping by your desk with suggestions. (laughs) Okay. I don't know why I find that funny, but like now that I'm my own boss, I don't know. I just, it's funny. Uh, You're left out of important meetings that you used to attend. Once friendly colleagues start to avoid you, you never get any feedback at all. You never ask for any feedback. You start comparing yourself to mediocre peers rather than stars. You're not sure what your boss cares about anymore. And lastly, you don't care what your boss cares cares about. Those are all signs that you are in trouble at work and you're either getting fired or perhaps different position on the way. Yeah, Any wow. of that happened to you? I don't really. I don't really. You're like, no, I've been my own boss for years. I, <laughs> I don't even know. Really... Boss? What the hell's that? I know. It's been a minute. But, yeah. uh, look, you can always see and follow us. Follow um, us on social media. It's Paul Wharton on Twitter. It's Paul Wharton Style on Instagram. Yes. Um, I've got two book signings this week. So tomorrow, guys, we fucked that podcast with two women, Corinne Fisher and Christina Hutchinson. Paul's like, what? <laughs> and they call it Sorry About Last Night, too. But uh, guys, we fucked podcast. It's the anti slut shame. Wow. Okay. They talk, uh, yeah, I was just listening to their show from this week where they were talking about shaving their own buttholes. And I was like, oh, how, do you, okay. how do you do that? Do you, don't you get waxed back there? Yeah. How do you, would you ever attempt to shave your own butthole? Um, I'm not there yet. <laughs> In fact, we're not there yet. Don't get me to lying. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I can't wait. That is going to be tomorrow night at DuPont Circle. It starts at six. It starts about seven, but I think doors DuPont open around. Right? DuPont Underground, yeah. yeah. And I haven't been, you haven't been. Mm-mm. Did you realize that under DuPont Circle, there was this whole like train station and like there was a train that went from like up to like um not quite to woodley park okay. but sort of up connecticut avenue went down connecticut avenue and both a little bit massachusetts avenue and it was its own train center there wow. yes and they're turning it into like a art space talk space and it's 
all like an underground. Very cool. Maybe I'll come by. Metro I'll stop. come by your event. Still tickets yeah. available for that. And then Friday night, Danny Starr, who's been on the podcast. She was on Tuesday's show. Uh, she has a book out, Empathy and Eyebrows. Um, I hope I get to host yours, Paul, one of your podcasts. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to have a lot of practice. <laughs> you certainly will. You certainly will. Uh, so Danny's is invite only, but we're doing a giveaway on my Instagram, Hey Fresh. So that's where you can catch us. Um, everything is happening there. Mervis, I think we're in good shape, right? We're in great shape. Since we're talking so much book talk, if you guys want to pre-order my book on Amazon.com yes. right now, it's called Pulling It All Together, Essential Style Advice on Being Beautiful, Confident, and Most of All, Happy. Are you going to do a, an episode or a chapter on shaving your own butthole? Like, is, Ew! <laughs> <laughs> is there that no, kind of advice? Like I do? <laughs> I mean, come on. You got to, like, you need that one. You know what? Oh, that's that not note, in the book? All right. <laughs> all right. I love you. No, he's like Sarah. My book is classic. <laughs> Bye, Paul. Bye, Bye Dad. Bye, Bye, guys. Phrase, what's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey, phrase. What's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey, phrase. What's the phrase that you hear? Tune in, yeah, you gotta tune in. Sarah Frazier on the mic, and she about to begin. The co host with the most Paul Warren looking fleek. Take it from me, you should be listening. Live from the Mason's Cap Pop Culture at its best.